All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am delighted to be joined by Betsy Allen Manning, who is in lovely Dallas, Texas today. How are you doing, Betsy? Yay, I'm doing great. <laughs> Beautiful weather today. Couldn't complain at all. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Betsy is a top uh, speaker and consultant, author of three books, including the Amazon bestseller, Win With People, The Triumph Method and Life in the Fast Lane, a human behavior expert, John Maxwell, uh, trainer and coach. Actually, I, I talked to re another one recently. Um, on that, but today we want to talk about uh, about leadership, right? And and here's the here's the thing, Betsy. What I wanted to talk to you about is, you know, it's a very fast paced world we're living in today, where people are bombarded on all sides with demands, and leaders probably feel like this is the most stressful period in their whole career. Um, so how do, how can leaders, you know, turn down the noise and reduce the stress levels? Yeah, I think and that's such a great question because we are we're so busy and as a leader, you know, when you're a, when you're an employee, you're just trying to manage yourself and there's mm -hmm. stress there, right? With other other employees around you. When you're a leader, you're not only managing your own schedule, you're managing the schedules of others and you're also managing all of the conflict and chaos that goes on with others mm -hmm. as well. So, there's a lot of stress, but I love this question because this is what I get called on for the most is when, when there's conflict, uh, when there's miscommunications happening. And one of the things I say is if you want to reduce stress and increase your productivity, then you have to understand how to communicate better with the different personality styles that you work with. And it is the foundation for me, uh, at least I believe it's a foundation for being an incredible leader. Um, and I call them I call them the four unspoken communication aggravators. Mm -hmm. There's four ways that we are aggravating, causing others frustration without them even knowing it. And John, the interesting thing is, is that, so studies have proven that um, over 60% of the time, people claim to have a bad experience when interacting with others. 60%. Oh, that's a huge percentage. So like, think about like, if you've been on an airplane before mm -hmm. and you're sitting next to someone you don't know and they start talking to you and I always engage in conversation. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you do, but I love to talk. But every now and then you get that person sitting next to you that you get this weird feeling mm -hmm. that I don't know what it is about them. I can't put my finger on it, but something about them kind of rubs me the wrong way. You ever felt that before? For sure. Yeah. Or that, that um, kind of slimy salesperson that you said, oh, I'm not going to. I'm not gonna buy anything from them. I don't trust yeah. them. Yeah, and yeah. you don't know why, but it happens. And so studies show we're gonna feel that way over 60% of the time uh -huh. when we're interacting with others. So here's the unfortunate news is that means that people are also gonna feel that way over 60% of the time when interacting with us. Yeah, yeah. No, that that is that is that is fascinating. And I guess then um, as a as a leader, you know we have natural. I mean, we have natural biases as people, and we want to feel comfortable, right? So, does that mean then that we are, you know, we communicate really well with the other forty percent, the people who we we are comfortable with and we know how to communicate with, and we relegate the other people who maybe we are less comfortable with because we just don't know how to communicate with them. And and that's generally it. Is that Here's the deal. We have been for years operating out of the golden rule when it comes to communicating. And this is why we miss that other, other, um, or for only 40% of the time we're actually hitting the mark because people do like the golden rule, do unto others as you'd have them mm -hmm. do under you. Right. It works for foundational respect with others. So if you don't want to be lied to, don't lie to somebody else. Right. You don't mm -hmm. like when people are late, don't be late for them. However, communication is not one size fits all. So the golden rule doesn't work because I can't say I like to communicate this way. Therefore, you must like to communicate. Mm -hmm. or, I like to work this way. You must like to work this way as well. We have different preferences in the workplace and the way we communicate. So I would suggest to use the honor rule when it comes to communicating with others, which is treat others as they prefer to be treated. And when you understand that, then you can meet someone where they're at. And it's not uh, being inauthentic, like being someone else all the time. It's simply visiting someone else's personality style when it's going to serve that relationship best or when it's going to help you be more productive mm -hmm. with others. So that's where those four communication aggravators come in. And I'll just kind of, I'll briefly yeah. tell them to you, but they're, the first is your motor style. It's, you can tell I'm a very fast paced <laughs> person. If I'm talking to someone that's slower pace, it gets on my nerves, right. but I understand <laughs> 
I need to slow down for them because I have to understand I'm also overwhelming them and giving them Mm -hmm. too much all at once. So we simply match their motor. The second one is our information style. Uh, We tend to give information the way we prefer to receive it. Some people just want, give me bullet points. Just boom, boom, boom. That's it. In an email, on the phone, that's what they want. But other people need more specifics and they won't, especially as a leader, there are employees that won't even get moving in, if they don't have all the specifics that they need and information. So if you understand which information style they prefer, then you can adapt and help win with them. Um, then third is our interaction style. So some people are more outgoing and they're going to mm-hmm. engage more often and some people are more reserved. If you're in a group meeting and you choose someone and to speak out in that group meeting and ask them to come up with an idea right there on the spot, they are going to be embarrassed. They're mm-hmm. going to think, give me enough time to process this question so I can come up with a good quality answer for you. And they're actually, it's actually going to go against what you're trying to do. Right. So with someone, so it's understanding their interaction styles actually helps you um, understand how to interact with them better. And then the last one is the one that causes up to 90% of conflict in our relationships in life. The biggest one of all, and it's our focus style. Uh, we, we see the world through different lenses. Mm-hmm. Some people are focused on the task, getting things done, and others are focused on building relationships and, and creating experiences. So I'll give an example how this can cause conflict. My husband and I, we've been married for six years. I love my husband. He's a great <laughs> man. We're very different though. He's task, task focused. I'm more people focused. Mm-hmm come to decorate our house for Christmas, right? Our very first year together. He goes, all right, let's get it done in two hours. You know, let's just get the decorations down, get it done. That's it. It's just a task for him. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was all about, well, this is part of us building an experience together as couples. So it was, let's get the eggnog. Let's put Christmas music on. (laughs) But when we're collaborating with others at work, we have to understand we're coming at it from different angles and we need to be able to meet each other's needs Um, and fulfill all of the needs so that way we can be more productive and build a better relationships in the meantime as well. So that is, um, and those are, those are all, uh, all great points. So that is from a leader, this is where the crux obviously of the leadership challenge comes in because uh, you have all these different personalities around you. So you have to flex to the different personalities and you, and they have to flex a bit to you as well, right? So how do you, how do you create an environment where you can strike that balance where you're able, you're, you're able to flex to people, but they're also realize that they, they also realize that they need to flex a bit to you too. Yeah. So one of the things I, I just worked with an organization, it's a home builders association mm-hmm. and I went in and did, um, a, a leadership training for the leaders, but I also did a staff training on DISC. Uh, DISC is the model of human mm-hmm. behavior I use to teach, and it's one of the most recognized ones as well, sure. um, to teach this uh, the, about the different personality styles. And after that, we ended up, cre- um, if, this is really neat because they emailed me last night, and they created for their door frames, before you enter someone's door frame, they created their personality style, what their motive, key motivators are, how they prefer to be communicated with, what their information needs are. So before someone even walks into their office, they say, okay, I need to remember how to communicate best with this person, especially if it's something I want from them, mm-hmm. I need to approach them in their style. So they have set their organization up for communicational success just by I'm implementing you know you can learn it but to truly live it mm-hmm. is a daily practice for sure so what are what are some of the i mean that's that's a great uh, scenario when that when that works but when when you have seen when you know leaders make mistakes and sort of uh, try to run their organization in one way i mean what what happens what, what's the dynamic that ends up happening when they, what kind of mistakes? Just- well, I mean, when they try to, you know, do a one size fits all communication style with everybody, I mean, what typically happens there? Well, okay, so let's take, for instance, there are methods you can use to coach people from poor behaviors into mm-hmm. better behaviors, right? We don't call them attitudes anymore, mm-hmm. <laughs> I call them behaviors in the mm-hmm. workplace. Um, now, if you're going to, you can use, there's something called the fear method where you simply state the fact. Uh, explain how it affects the team, uh, tell the action you want them to take, and the results, good or bad, from from all of that, right? You can use that fear method. However, 
it's going to change how you approach each person. Because if someone is more task focused, they may not want a touchy feely side of it. Mm -hmm. And that relationship building side of it, if someone is more based off of emotions, then you're going to need to approach, approach them more on an emotional basis. So it's understanding what each person needs. So like the, the, in disc, the S is this for the supporters, they want to feel appreciated. They want to feel that they have some sort of significance in the workplace. So I can mm -hmm. use coaching methods it, to help show them how when you improve in this way, you become more valued, more appreciated, and right. significant to, to our mission within this organization. Make sense? Yeah, no, it does. And so here's one of the things that I think uh, uh, afflicts a lot of organizations, and this is obviously the culture, right? And you have to you um from what you're outlining now i mean if you're having a community if you're going to have this kind of communication you need to build a culture that allows for that right and most organizations in my experience uh the culture has has developed or evolved organically or it's taken it's just its personality from the leader or the top guy or whatever so what are some of the things that you need to do organizationally or culturally to really mold a culture where this kind of communication can be effective and you can have you can have a scenario where people can be communicated with and, and, and motivated differently I think this is such a great question and i love what you said about most people it, with most companies it just happens organically because they're not strategic about mm -hmm. the culture they want. You have to be intentional. And one of the reasons is that companies that have a stronger culture or a strong established culture actually see four times more profits than companies that try and grow mm -hmm. their culture organically. So that is a huge. So think about when we think about culture, I think about Disney. They create this culture of magic. That you know, you know, when you meet a Disney employee, there's magic everywhere. And I was able to work with them. And I loved uh, when, when they teach you how to implement magic wherever you go. So someone would come up and say, hey, they were upset. You know, I wanted to talk to Ariel. We wanted to take a picture with her. She's not there. When is she going to be back? And they're upset. And you just look at them keeping the magic alive and saying, Ah, Ariel is actually on a break right now. So she went out swimming with the dolphins. Mm -hmm. so she'll be back in 15 minutes. And if you get in line right now, you'll be at the front to take pictures with her. <laughs> oh, yay. We're happy. You know, and you keep the magic alive. Mm -hmm. That, but they were very intentional about saying we are all about magic, sprinkling magic everywhere. So think about Apple is all about innovation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Southwest Airlines is all about inserting fun into everything that they do. So what is that thing that you want to implement within your employees? So first of all, what are the values and standards that you have established that they can, that they can get on board with and display those values and standards? But I say that it, it, what you want to do is create what I call your organizational DNA. Mm -hmm. So think of your DNA as your makeup, right, of who, mm -hmm. of who you are. So an organization's DNA is the makeup of who that organization is for Disney it's magic, right? It, something like that. So DNA stands for um, developing a positive culture where people work better together. That's where we bring DISC in and helping them understand mm -hmm. each other's styles better. The N is to navigate and innovate through market changes so you can continue to reach goals faster. And the A is for advancing your high level or high potential employees to leadership so they can help train and retain your best employees. Because mm -hmm. we move up into leadership roles because we're the best at our job. But then we don't know how to manage people and the people end up leaving because you weren't a good manager and you weren't <laughs> trained how to be one. Yeah. So. And, 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 I, and I always have a bit of a pet peeve about that, about, you know, where, I don't know if you found this, but whenever you talk to, um, you know, when I run organizations, you know, and I talk to people and say, you know, what, what are your career goals? Oh, I want to manage people. And I was always like, why well, that should not just that should not be the only goal in life is to manage people. There are other things that you could excel at. And quite frankly, like I, I think the fact if you want to manage people, that should almost disqualify you in the first place. But <laughs> I think that, that people say uh, I call them paycheck leaders. Yeah. You know, I just want to tell other people what to do so yeah. they can do, you know, they can do all the work and I can just sit back and they think that's what leadership is about, right? It's yeah. just a position or title. Yeah. And they don't realize, no, it's not. It's it's a responsibility. And I, I say, you know, you can either be a paycheck leader who focuses on yourself so you can become successful, mm -hmm. or you can be an impact leader who focuses on the success of others and you become more significant within mm -hmm. your organization. 
Yeah, and I couldn't agree more. And just getting back to the culture thing for a moment. So uh, what I've also seen is that then there are organizations who go, you know, they look at Disney or they look at what they look at these other ones and they say, OK, well, that's just the key. Let's uh, we'll we'll pick a corporate color and we'll send everybody T-shirts and we'll put in a foosball <laughs> table and you know, on a massage chair and we'll do we'll be fun. We'll be a fun organization. But after a month or two, uh, nothing has changed because, you know, people, the foosball table is gathering dust and people are sick of looking at the same <laughs> T-shirt color all the time. So, uh, you know, how do you help people like strike that balance that it's not just about, you know, you know, everybody going rah, rah, but it is meaningful. Culture is a meaningful thing. Yeah, I think one of the ways you do that is you have to be able to establish what your core values are. Mm -hmm. And because that, it, that is, you know, if it's magic, if it's innovation, uh, when I worked for uh, Steve Wynn, right, he had Encore and Wynn hotels, he uh, built a $70 million venue, uh, went into Encore, and I came on board to hire and train staff for it. One of the things that their leaders do is go through this intensive leadership program, and you get ingrained into you what the four core values are of the organization, and how to display those four core values, so you're your, your employees are getting that example. And what I love that they did, because hotels have very long hallways, as you know, so sure. where the staff are in the back, in this one long hallway that you have to walk past in order to get to work is, no matter where you work, is this employee wall of fame. And as you're walking by, it's not only just a picture of employee of the month and their name and the, the month that they got employee of the month. But below that is the story of a customer that wrote in that said, this is what this person did. And, and then they list which of the four core values it aligned with. Mm. Right. So um, there was a lady that um, didn't have time. She really wanted one of the ornaments. It was around right Christmas time. She said, I didn't have time to get to the gift shop. I really wanted it. Uh, the ornament, oh, will you let me know if there's somewhere I can buy it online? And when they ordered her limo the next day for her going home, she found when she got inside the limo, they have a little gift bag in there. She opened it up and it was the ornament that she wanted. You know, that's not something the employee has to do, mm -hmm. but they're, but they know. And when she wrote in, she said, it's obvious that here at Wynn Hotel, your employees care about everyone and everything. That's one of the four core values. Right. When people are writing into your company and they're stating what your core values are and how they experienced it without even knowing what they are, that's when you know you've hit the mark. Yeah. And, and I love that answer because I think that gets into the fundamental. It's about how you make your customers feel. It shouldn't be about how you're, you know, you shouldn't be focused inwards when you're doing, when you're figuring out your culture should be one that delights your customers. And however you do that and however you achieve that is the right way, you know, should be the right way for you. But it's, as you say, but it's not about, it's not about gimmicks. It's about, it's about real thought going into it and, and ingraining values so that you would, you would think, because in the normal way, you probably would go, oh, well, they wanted an ornament, whatever. Not, not my problem, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, but if you were, but if that's, if it's ingra if those values are ingrained in you, you then go, oh, no, I, actually, it is my problem. Exactly. And you you actually care about it enough to want to make a difference. And when you're walking past that employee hall of fame, it makes you look and read a story and say, I could do that. Yeah. I can be, I can be employee of the month. You know, right. I, I could yeah. do something like that too. And then you get ideas. What I like about what they did is they created a customer service within that transferred to the customer. So when you have that, that customer service of my fellow employees are also my customers, I want to do things for them. So when we were, um, when we were training the employees for Encore, for Encore Beach Club, I was staying at the hotel and I remember I was giving a speech the next day. So I brought some stuffed animals from home, put them on the bed, I put some hats on them and sunglasses. And um, I was giving a speech, you know, like practicing in front uh, of my, my stuffed animals there. You were wondering where that was going. Didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm sitting there, I'm practicing and all of a sudden the maid must have knocked and I didn't hear her. And she opened the door and she's like, Oh, and she, there I am. She's looking at me as I'm speaking to stuffed animals that are wearing hats and sunglasses on the bed. And I said, I'm not crazy. I have to give a big speech for our big opening tomorrow. And I was just practicing to make sure it goes well. And she said, okay, well, I, I, the next day, I give the big speech. We have our opening day. I mean, I get back. It was a 16 hour day. Mm -hmm. I get back to the room. All I want to do is go to sleep. 
Uh, and I get to the hotel room, open the door, and there was, <laughs> she put the remote in one of the stuffed animal's <laughs> hands, but she had a little note there. And it said, I know you knocked it out of the park today. Congratulations on a successful opening. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. She didn't have to do that, mm-hmm. but that was customer service within that that also transfers now to the customers as well mm-hmm. yeah no i think that's a that's a phenomenal um that's a phenomenal anecdote there and and a great tip too for people if you're practicing for a speech bring stuffed animals along i think that's a <laughs> it's a two for there um <laughs> okay so we're bumping up against the end of our time uh, betsy here but before we go i want to give an opportunity for you to tell people a little bit more about yourself how they can learn more about you and get in contact with you Sure, sure. I and mean, if you're looking for a, um, a leadership speaker for an upcoming event, you can always come to my website, uh, BetsyAllenManning.com, um, or you can contact me at Betsy at BetsyAllenManning.com. And if you're looking for some organizational or leadership development, uh, we've worked with uh, many organizations um, from small to large, and we just love seeing the transformation. Yeah, it's fantastic. Well, it's been a it's been a pleasure talking with you, and it's been very interesting. Uh, and I hope uh, everybody has enjoyed it. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine Pipeline of CRM. I'll see you all for another expert insight interview soon. Thanks again, Betsy, and hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening. <laughs>